So, once more, a monk asked Kyovin, what is the meaning of Bodhidharmas coming from the West? Mm. Kyovin said, sitting long and getting tired. Well, I didn't particularly intend to talk so much about this koan. It just came to me when I saw on the first day how many of you were looking so tired. I just remembered this one. But it seems to be working for us because we can see different approaches to working with the koan. First of all, it sounds like some mumbo-jumbo, an odd joke of some sort or a bit of a random snippet of conversation which doesn't amount to much. And then we start beginning to see, well, some possibility of some meaning there, something being pointed to, some truth, maybe rather mundane or maybe rather deeper. The truth that, yeah, well, Zen does involve sitting long and getting tired. Rather mundane truth or maybe a more profound truth that, in the moment of speaking, he was just sharing his experience of the moment. But then we also see how the koan turns back on us. It prods us. Do you know why Bodhidharma came from the West? It asks, do you know the essence of Zen? And you begin to cringe a bit and think, ooh, hmm, bit of a blind spot there, yeah. Then you start thinking, why am I, why am I doing this anyway? I don't even know what it is. But, mm, and so it begins to poke at you. The koan is investigating you. It's shining a floodlight on you. And highlighting bits you normally overlook or hide from. But they're now in the full glare of the light. And that can be somewhat uncomfortable. So in relation to this koan, indeed, again... Why Zen? Why practicing Zen? Don't even understand the essence of it. <clears throat> Don't know what it's for. Hmm. Well, of course, there could be different motivations. It could be you have a great faith in the practice for some reason. It just seems right. You trust it. Maybe along the same way, but a slightly weaker word, you could say you have some confidence. You've had some experience in the practice which gives you some confidence it's worth persisting. But maybe it's not quite that, it's more like hope. Or even desperation. Huh. I've gone through the whole alphabet, trying to find a way out. I've tried aromatherapy. <laughs> I've tried Bach flower remedies. I've tried Qigong. I've tried Taoism. I've reached the end of the alphabet, surely this time. Hmm. There's nothing left. I've got to give this my full effort. Hmm. So indeed, this question prods, why are you practicing? And of course, your own individual koans prod maybe the same issue, but also different issues. What's the difficulty in practicing? What's the difficulty in being you? Why is life so uncomfortable? Why am I so uncomfortable? Why am I hoping to avoid all that by practicing Zen and having some sort of experience and cancelling out all my suffering and pain and confusion and being permanently enlightened and everything being okay? Yeah, there's a taste of... That seems to be... I'm hoping for a taste of that. That does seem to be a little bit of an uncomfortable truth to acknowledge, but maybe that's the bit of the game I'm playing. And stating it boldly like that, 
it begins to seem a little bit sort of feeble. Oh dear, Ooh, what game am I playing? Is there a way out? So the con prods us and points us. Highlighting various things about ourselves, various things which we might rather overlook, various things which you might especially hope that others will overlook. So is this an unfortunate side effect of the koan? Or is this the purpose of working with the koan? Or is that even a meaningful question or distinction? Well, it depends somewhat on your approach. And it also depends somewhat on what comes along. And maybe there's a certain amount of tuning of the approach that's appropriate here. There is the approach to practice which just says whatever comes along is not it, drop it. Whatever answer presents itself, it's not an answer, drop it. Whatever difficulty presents itself, it's illusory, drop it. Keep marching ahead. Keep firmly centred and focused on the practice. Keep going on and on and on till you break through. Single-minded, dedicated, unswerving. This is a valid approach. Where does it take you? Perhaps indeed it takes you to an experience of enlightenment. And then where? Then you continue. Because there's more to do. It's not that you have an experience and that's the end of practice. In many ways, when people have an experience of enlightenment, they realise it's the beginning of practice. That searchlight has got so bright, it showed so much needing to be done, and you sort of may have managed to sidestep it, bypass it, and just march on, and have a breakthrough. But then you realise the mess is still there to be dealt with. You've maybe got a different motivation now for dealing with it, and maybe new skills and new insights. But the mess still needs to be dealt with. Otherwise you're in a sort of enlightened mess. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but there was a practitioner once who had previously had an enlightenment experience confirmed by Master Sheng Yen. And on retreat with me she said, I felt I was nearly there again, but I couldn't quite break through. Simon, what should I have done? So we got to chatting to her a bit, and within a few minutes she was admitting, well, actually I'm quite an arrogant person. Actually, I'm quite an arrogant bitch, really, was the phrase she used. So it's sort of like she was wanting to be an arrogant bitch Buddha, wasn't she? She wanted to find a shortcut which didn't involve confronting her arrogance, We'll just make her into a Buddha. But of course that's not so. She might even have managed to have another enlightenment experience, but still the arrogance would cause troubles for her and for those around her. At some point, if she's wanting full enlightenment, she has to confront that arrogance. And of course often arrogance is based on insecurity, it's bluster, it's hiding, putting up a front. So, these tendencies that the Khan uncovers in us, maybe it is possible to bypass them and just keep going, and just keep going, and just keep going. But that doesn't mean we've avoided them. <coughs> We're just delaying confronting them. How about confronting them now, whilst they're immediately in front of us? <coughs> in a sense, do the work that needs to be done. Do it now instead of delaying it. Because at some point, this tendency needs to be confronted. And there's the uh, added bonus that if you confront the problem now, 
it might actually accelerate your progress. To give a metaphor here, it's like uh, you're following the method of just going ahead, just going ahead, not, in, not dealing with any obstructions that arise. And as a result, you actually are obstructed and you're sort of fighting a battle to move forward. And you're not allowing yourself just to sort of uh, untangle it in a way which will be quite easy. It's like sometimes practice is like you're walking in treacle. You're thigh deep in treacle. And you could say, well, I don't need to deal with the treacle. I don't need to know why I'm in treacle. I don't need to pay any attention to that. I will just keep going slowly for a while, but I'll keep going. But sometimes you just need to look down and you see indeed your thigh deep in treacle. But one foot away there's a hose. You can pick the hose and wash the treacle away. The same with some of these things that we encounter in the mind. We encounter various knots and habits of thinking. Internal rules, assumptions about the way the world is. And actually we can prick them and pop them. And they're gone. To do that, we have to allow ourselves to notice them, to look at them, to see through them. And if we're taking a, a straight ahead, maybe even call it blinkered approach to practice, then we remain stuck longer than necessary. Somewhat stubborn approach. So there's a case for us saying, well, indeed, it's sticking me. I'm feeling very stuck, I'm feeling very sluggish, I'm feeling distracted. There's a case for sometimes noticing that, exploring that, because some of these things are quite easily let go of once they're confronted. The reason they've persisted and recurred over many years is because you haven't yet looked at them. Now the koan is bringing it to light in a clearer way than you've seen before. You're admitting something to yourself that you don't usually admit. You're touching something which you don't usually touch. This can be a useful opportunity to wash that bit of treacle away. To release that fixed view. That fixed view that I'm better than everybody else that leads to arrogance. Or that fixed view that I'm useless. Which can also lead to arrogance, but can also lead to defeatism. Giving up. And then you just realise it's a view. Actually, the experience of your life doesn't sustain that view. The views sort of become self-sustaining. It's a fixed idea. But if you allow yourself to confront it, it can just dissolve in front of you. Not always, because sometimes it's reinforced by other ideas and they get tangled up. And that requires a bit more exploration. But it can be as simple as directly confronting what's presenting itself to you. And it releases itself before your very eyes. And then your practice continues. Not at a sluggish pace, held back by treacle. It leaps forward. It's free. It's reinvigorated. So there is a case for, indeed, allowing yourself what might seem like a little diversion. Just to look down at the feet and see what it is that's making them sticky. To look at the mind and see what's making it dull. To look at your fears and see how they're affecting your motivation to practice. But then this, these little diversions, these can also become distractions. This is where there's a little bit of a balancing act to be played. It's not sort of like uh, your route is this way and you've got to comb all the ground in all directions all the way to make sure nothing is untouched. You never get there. It's not some sort of psychoanalysis where everything must be dug out before you can start work. It's more pragmatic. It's more like 
I felt as I was moving freely, and now I'm not. What's happened? What's going on? What's in the way? Hmm. Ah, that's in the way. Hmm. So the practice throws up certain characteristics of yours, certain obstructions, vexations. And in this context, the word obstruction is a good one because it's it shows the uh, the way that it stops us moving. We feel blocked. We feel we can't go on. We might feel we want to go on, but we can't make it happen. Maybe we get stuck in a loop. The same thought keeps going back, or the same mood. It feels like there's nothing moving. So when that's happening, allow yourself to experience that. Don't say, it shouldn't be so. Say, it is so. Let it through into awareness. It is so. Experience the stuckness, and maybe the frustration the dismay, the distress that might go with that. And experience, what shall we say, the context for the stuckness, the size of it, maybe the history of it, maybe the recurrent nature of it and how it's so painful that it keeps on happening. And allow it to be experienced. And the experiencing part is important. If it's just a story, then indeed it can just be a looping story. But if you allow yourself to feel the emotional quality of it, the depth of the pain that it's giving you, that might seem challenging. But it's also where the possibility for movement arises. This recurring thought train has given me so much pain. I need to deal with it. I need to move beyond it. I need to let go of it. I need to take that risk. And often there's a feeling of risk in being different in the world. Because we're creatures of habit. We've found a way of being in the world which has got us by. Well, none of us have died so far, anyway. So it seems to have worked. So doing something different, holding a different attitude, Holding a different idea could seem risky because it's not what I've done and what I've done works. So we find ourselves maybe a bit scared, a bit challenged. But seeing the depth of the pain that this is giving us, we also begin to get the courage to try something different. Yes, it's kept me alive, I've stayed alive, but what a painful life. I've been this way so long, I don't want to be this way anymore. And this is strengthened because of the clarity that working with the Koan gives you. The first day or so, I was exhorting you to uh, try and be present, try and arrive, try and be here, against the difficult tendency of the mind to wander off to home and to work and to friends and family. But now you're engaged with the koan. Yes, the mind wanders some of the time, but not nearly as much as it was. So the koan has this function of clearing the mind. The mind is much more focused and present with the koan now. And so there's much less distraction and clutter. And so the tendency of the mind to have these fixed views and habits and attitudes is more clearly seen. And that increased clarity of seeing increases the possibility of seeing through, of letting go, of releasing and moving on. make use of this sharp investigative power of the koan. Inserting itself into your mind and niggling away at these corners which you try and keep covered up but it's needling them out 
and saying, look at this too. Indeed, look at it. Areas of fear, areas of selfishness, areas of hope, areas of depression. Could say a long list there. But these are being brought to awareness through the Khan. Allow them to be in awareness. Allow yourself to feel the weight of them. Allow yourself at least the possibility of change. I've been this way so long, does that mean I have to continue that way? Or does that mean I can now move on? And feel the fear of moving on. The fear of disaster. The fear of failure or embarrassment, whatever it might be. And recognise that fear is part of what's trapping you. But now you're finding strength to confront that fear because the other side of the scales it's becoming clearer yeah the possibility of release from this burden I hardly really acknowledge it as a burden previously because it was just how it was but now I see it's stale old behaviour fossilised it's not serving me well it's painful, it's frightening to consider change, but it's even more frightening to consider never changing. And suddenly the scales flip. You're lighter. The burden's gone, you're moving again. You're moving into a new way of being, and you're moving forward in your practice. This takes very many forms. Each of us are different. But these habitual tendencies, as they're called, that we've picked up through life, can take the form of habits of action, habits of thinking, attitudes, prejudices, assumptions about how things are, unchallenged, these types of things. And we come across them and we find, oh, I've got rather fixed there. I'm in treacle. And it needn't be so. But do you dare wash away the treacle? Or is it something which you feel is sort of like a comfort blanket? Or is it just smothering you? This is very much the koan investigating you. And this investigation is done largely wordlessly. It's done in the sense of just allowing yourself to feel the weight of what's arising. It doesn't have to be thought through and evaluated and uh, unpicked. But sometimes that can help. Sometimes the unpicking, the understanding, the intellectual understanding can help when it's stuck. But it's not the first tool you reach for. The first tool is just letting itself arise in awareness and present itself to you and honestly and fully experience it. And there's a great power in that. And that is the approach of the wordless investigation of you. Sometimes it sticks and you can't quite make it move and you can't quite understand it further and it just feels a bit stagnant. Maybe that's when you reach out for the extra tools of the analytical investigation. What is going on here? What's going on? Where did this come from? Can I remember when this first started? Does this seem to be helping me in some way? Is that why I'm afraid to let go of it? This is like reaching out for that hose pipe. 
But before you can reach for the hosepipe, you need to acknowledge the stuckness. And that's the wordless investigation, the just experiencing, being you in the situation you're in. The heaviness, the weight, the burden, the pain, the despair. So indeed, let the koan work on you. It doesn't need to be directed to do so. It does so automatically. As you play around with the koan, it's okay to play with it and explore different corners and angles of it. As you play around with it, you get surprised by certain things being triggered in you. Ha, huh. hmm. Hadn't seen that. Hmm. So, Every now and again, pick up the cone with a fresh eye. Just read it again. You may have already got into certain habits of reading the cone. You may have identified with one character more than another, for example. Particularly the cones that have two genders in them, you may be identifying with the one the same gender as you, and sort of not so much with the other one. So try swapping characters. Is there another point of view here? Take a fresh eye to the car. It may prod you in a different way, which helps you to realise the nature of your stuckness. This isn't treacle, this is concrete. <laughs> well, maybe it's just a few wisps of cotton wool. The treacle all evaporated. A long time ago, I've just assumed it's still there. But it's gone. Huh. A fresh eye. A fresh awareness. And continue the practice. Time and again, pick up the Koran. I am going to go and feel exposed by the koan. Do all this with a mind of, not of knowing, not of concept, not of words, not of stories. Do it with the mind of experiencing, the mind of feeling. The mind which just feels the moment, senses it. This sensing of the moment is really the only response you can have to something which can't be known in the sense this moment's only just arrived. How can you say you know it? You haven't even had a chance to look at it yet. And it's already gone. There's another moment. How can you know this moment? It's only just arrived. Any sense of knowing the moment means you're stuck in past ideas extrapolating forwards. You're stuck in theoretical knowledge and assuming it applies to this moment. But this moment is brand new and fresh. So instead of knowing we have to take the approach of, we can call it not knowing, and maybe we could use the word doubt. Doubt without the negative connotation of the word doubt. Doubt meaning, don't know. Intriguing, curious, fresh. This moment, fresh, unknown. I don't know it. And in a larger scale, this life, I don't know it. I see corners of it poking out now and again. I get glimpses. But I don't know it. And notice your habitual tendency of creating a known. Labels, constructions, ideas. And don't do that. Allow yourself to rest in not knowing. 
That's the only honest response. Allow yourself to be honest in that way. To acknowledge, I don't know this life. I don't know this moment. But to know it is so crucial. Without it, what is life? Without knowing this moment, can I said to be alive? I'm unconscious. I'm unconscious at the moment. So the doubt is an invitation to sharp attention to this moment, to this experience unframed by knowledge and past experience. It's an openness to fully experience this without trying to categorize or label this as something other. Fully this now fresh immediate directly experienced Throw yourself fully into that. And notice how easy it is to slip out of that, slip into a habit of constructing it as something known so that you can look away and move on in some way to some other self-directed project. But no, again, stay with the not knowing. We can say, just gaze into the mystery of the moment. Maybe somewhat awestruck. This is it. And in this way of being, these burdens we carry are dropped away because they're all from history. They're ideas from the past. They're judgments from the past. There are stories, concepts, memories from the past. They have no place in this moment. This moment brings you what is relevant to this moment. You are completely free of all those burdens. If you can just simply gaze directly on this moment with an unknowing mind, with an open mind. The corn is inviting you to do that. Each time you find yourself veering towards some sort of answer and giving up on it and dropping it, maybe at least briefly, you're in the unknown. So quickly you try and create another answer but then drop it. See if you can stay in the state of having dropped the answer and just being with the Khan, just being with yourself, just being with the moment. You slip away into thinking, into ideas, bring yourself back. You get too tangled up in the ideas and you can't bring yourself back? Indeed, investigate those and find a way to loosen them and wash them away. And return to the clarity of just being present with the unknown. The method of this is already described. Simply pick up the koan. Allow it to be the tool which sharpens your attention. Don't be con too concerned with which way it's pointing, whether it's pointing to itself or to you. Either way, it's part of the practice. But as it continues to work, you'll find it points all directions. Allow it to do so. 
as I say, it can be seen as like a searchlight, or like a surgical knife, or like a lance of some sort, lancing a boil. It just pokes in all around. Allow it to do so and experience the result of that. Depending on your energy, you may take different approaches. Master Shengen used to talk sometimes about taking either a relaxed approach or a vigorous approach. And you can see how it is for you. If you've uh, got the energy and having a very single-minded energetic <laughs> approach can be very powerful. Not allow any wandering mind to take you away from the koan. Not allow any bodily discomfort or pains to distract you. Totally focused on the koan. No slipping of the mind. No slipping of the body. No slipping of the attention. Very firm, dedicated, energetic approach. This can be very tiring. And then you might, you might sort of have to give up. So don't overdo it. And the relaxed approach is also valid. It's more like a softer approach. Allow the corn to be in the mind. Allow it to wander through the mind. Allow it to flow freely, unobstructed. But there's no great effort, no great pushing. But there is the tension of experiencing it, knowing it. This more softer approach, maybe a little bit more risk of you dozing off, drifting off, but less risk of you getting overtired. It doesn't have to be these two poles, it could be somewhere in between, you could calibrate it somewhere in between. And it's not finding one fixed place, it can be different at different times of day as the energy shifts. So keep in touch with the state of your practice. Keep in touch with the state of your mind. Keep in touch with the fruit of your practice, where it's taking you, what it's showing you. But don't be apart from the practice. Every moment is practice sitting here, hearing me now, sitting on the cushion in formal practice, walking, working, eating, toilet, rest, anything. These are all opportunities to investigate. Investigate the koan in that situation. The koan investigates you in that situation. The practice goes on continuously. And unless it becomes a continuous practice, it's not a very powerful practice. Because the gaps in the continuity can become your hiding places where you switch off the searchlight. But if the practice becomes continuous, then everything is revealed. And this is where we use these words like great doubt and great determination. Really, the word great stands for total. Total determination. Total energy. Total commitment to the practice. And total doubt. Nothing slips by as being known. Everything is challenged and realised to be a fixed idea. Unknown, really, ultimately. So if you find yourself holding some view, some idea, some construction of mind, then you're not yet in great doubt. You've got corners of the mind which you regard as known, as fixed. Let them go. Be totally open. Then we might be approaching great doubt. <laughs> 